Hey there cats and kitties, I am the Blues Man, Johnny Blues, and this is going to be my Winter 2019 Anime Watch List. And uh, this is going to be a list comprising everything that I'm watching in the Winter 2019 season. Not exclusively anime, but live action shows as well, because I'm just that way. I like to talk about everything that I'm watching, whether it be animated or live action. And uh, as well as a few series in this listing that uh, either haven't actually begun airing as of the time of this recording, but I know pointedly I will be watching, or have actually come out but haven't been sub subtitled or have been poorly subtitled and I'm you know waiting around for the official subs and things like that um so this is going to be a list comprising all seven days of the week broken up as you know each day of the week and uh, let's get right into it so starting off with Sundays the first thing on my list is Star Wars Resistance which is of course the latest animated Star Wars series falling on in the you know sort of vein of Rebels and things like that although this one takes place just precursor to Star Wars The Force Awakens, so you have characters like Poe, General Leia, BB-8, and things like that alongside the new cast of characters. And uh, it's been charming for the most part. It's definitely more pointed toward a younger audience, kids and things like that. Um, but I do find it does make me laugh on occasion. Sometimes it gets a little pedantic and annoying. Uh, but, you know, it, it's meant for younger audiences, more ADHD <laughs> You know, sort of attention span and things like that. Um, following on from there, the first anime series I have listed actually just, you know, wrapped up as of the time of this recording in the last couple of days um, was Surune Kazumai Koko Kyudabu. Surune, uh, if you've seen either of the posts I made on my Facebook account or my YouTube community feed, I was saying that, you know, this series was beautiful from the beginning. From the characterization to the animation to the camaraderie between the characters and that was all the way up through to the finale i never thought i could be as invested as i was in archery as this series made me become and uh it was just a fantastic fantastic series a uh, holdover from the previous season of course so technically it falls in that line but because i was still watching it through this season I wanted to mention it. Um, third on my list for Sundays is The Magnificent Kotobuki. And uh, this, you know, I, I wanted to watch this because I kind of was reminded of Ken Cole, uh, Kentai Collection Ken Cole, which I really loved, even though it was not a perfect series at all whatsoever. <laughs> it definitely had issues, pacing and direction and editing and things like that. Um, but it was primarily the characters that I really loved in that series. And uh, even, you know, Brave Witches, the spinoff to Strike Witches, it, it kind of embodies that, you know, the same kind of framework where you're following a bunch of female characters. In this case, in this series, Kotobuki, they are, uh, you know, sort of war pilots and things. And it's very sort of 1944, World War II era technology and whatever like that. Um, and But the thing is, <laughs> I find two episodes in... And, oh my god, it's annoying. It's an annoying series. Constantly the characters are bickering. Constantly they are talking a mile a minute and talking over each other. The subtitles are going by so quickly I have to constantly wind it back and see what I missed. And uh, they're just, they're unlikable thus far. I, I don't know if I'm going to stick with this series because it has none of the feel of, of what I hoped it would as being. Kind of like a Brave Witches or like a Can Cole and uh, so I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to continue <laughs> watching it. Um, I'm going to see what the third episode beholds. But, you know, it is on my list because I am checking it out in any case. And then rounding us off for Sundays is How Clumsy You Are, Miss Uino. And uh, this is a short subject comedy series, which is kind of, you know, mostly perverted comedy. Um, everything from, you know, drink my pee to uh i have this sort of invisibility cloak thing that i've invented so look at my crotch because you won't be able to see it <laughs> all that kind of stuff um it is definitely off-putting in some of its ideas but it's it's weird and funny at the same time it's kind of a perverse sense of humor and uh, for whatever reason it hasn't done anything that has really turned me off as yet so i'm watching it That'll bring us on to Mondays, and I'm um, watching two shows on Mondays. One is That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime. Of course, this is a carryover from the previous season, and it's been really entertaining, and I just really love the characters. And this is another series that, interestingly enough, because it is an isekai, you wouldn't necessarily think of it this way. Usually, isekai series are more harem and, and things like that. Um, but this one, not so much. It does have a, a little bit of a harem quality, but it is not the, the aspect of the show that they oversell it on, you know, that kind of thing. Um, there is more a sense of camaraderie, like I mentioned with the Sorune uh, series, where the main character just is able to 
you know, bring people together, bring different species together through a lot of ass kicking and supernatural super abilities and things like that. Um, but it's just been really fun and enjoyable. And I, I tend to like and gravitate toward most Isekai series because I'm a big RPG fan, going back to Final Fantasy and things of that nature. And uh, so, you know, it, it's not every Isekai series rubs me the right way. There are some that I, I don't like at all. But this one's got whatever it takes to, to keep me interested and entertained. And then uh, rounding us out for Monday is Dororo. And uh, this is another series that I mentioned recently uh, in my Facebook and community, YouTube community posts about how brilliant the third episode was and, and how it was, uh, you know, just the characterization of the series, the feudal Japan framework, the supernatural elements that are involved, demons and the main character and, and well, the, the couple of main characters their partnership and uh the man who raised the main character was the focus of the latest episode it's just it's just really really awesome and investing from the get-go and uh i couldn't more highly recommend you know for the winter 2019 season checking it out if you haven't already and uh, that'll bring us on to tuesdays and uh, the first series i'm watching that i have listed is actually the first of the live action series i'll be talking about lethal weapon season three now i'm actually three episodes behind uh season three of this series of course, season three marked the entire shakeup of the series where they had fired the actor who had played Riggs and, uh, you know, breaking up that duo of Riggs and Murtaugh. And they introduced a new character played by Sean William Scott, um, who I, I, you know, I was really apprehensive about the changes to the show. And I found it mostly still enjoyable, although and Damon Wayans pisses me off <laughs> because he was the instigator for a lot of the shakeup of the show. And he was even threatening to leave the show toward the end of uh, 2018, you know, I, I don't know whether he's trying to get more bank out of it and get more money, whatever it was, uh, not have to do as much work. I don't know. Um, but you know, it, it's still a passable series in season three, even amongst all the changes. And then getting on to the anime for Tuesdays, of course, I'm watching still Black Clover. It's still ongoing f through the past <laughs> you know, few seasons. You know, we're in this episode 60 something now. And uh, I just really enjoy it. I enjoy it much more than I ever could have anticipated. I say this every time I mention the show. Um, but I am enjoying it much more than I ever could have anticipated in the early going when I dropped it as of episode six in doing episodic review coverage. Um, it just, it you know, it only gets so far episode to episode and you end up enjoying it and, and being sort of, uh, you know, enthralled by it. But it's not enough to talk about. So that's why I, I decided very early on to not even cover it in episodic reviews, just to watch it and enjoy it for what it was. And it's been enjoyable. Um, next on my list, this is going to be where I, I begin to talk about things that either haven't aired as yet or have but haven't been subtitled or have been poorly, uh, you know, sort of broken English subtitled by fans, you know, fan subs. Um, the first on my list is Minaria Friends which, uh, you know, I remember watching the first episode of, and it was kind of boring. Um, it's, it's loosely related to the uh, Shingeki no Bahamut series, Rage of Bahamut. And uh, I liked both seasons of, of Rage of Bahamut proper. Um, this one, it, it just, you know, it was a short subject first episode. It aired, like, you know, weeks or months ago. And um, the proper airing cycle was meant to start in January at some point. I'm waiting for episode two. I don't know when it's going to come out, but uh, it's, you know, it, it was kind of boring, but I liked at the tail end, the end card had a, you know, paid homage to Rage of Bahamut, some of the characters from that. And I'm just waiting to see how good or bad it's going to continue to be whenever it comes out. Um, next on the list of things that have not yet come out or have not been subtitled correctly yet is Circlet Princess. I uh, sampled out some of the first episode and it was really poorly subbed like a fan sub and it was broken English and a lot of it didn't quite make sense. The translation was too literal. So you couldn't really get a full estimation of what exactly was being said. Um, and it's one that, it, you know, the animation, the style, the vibe of it, it seems like something I'm going to gravitate toward and I'm going to want to watch. And so I'm just waiting for it to be properly subbed to actually be able to invest myself in it. And then rounding us off for Tuesdays, a series that has not actually officially aired yet, it's Piano No Mori Season 2. I loved the first season. Um, I, I talked a lot about it, I believe, uh, on Facebook and things like that. It was before my YouTube community feed opened up, so I didn't get to talk about it there. But I would post write-ups from time to time about how meticulous and gorgeous the music and not necessarily the animation. The animation did suffer in places, but 
the characterization and the emphasis on classical music was really what was inspiring to me about the series. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to season two. I believe it's going to be, you know, beginning on the, the 28th of January, as of the time of this recording, a few days from now. So I'm looking forward to that. That'll bring us on to Wednesdays. And uh, the first show I have listed is a live action series. It's uh, Riverdale season three. I am currently two episodes behind on that, but uh, I love, love, love Riverdale. I've done videos talking about it because Archie comics were some of the first comics I was ever debuted to and uh, always loved the humor and the comedy. And, and this show is nothing like that. It is nothing like, you know, sort of a, a Dawson's Creek drama. It's more like a, a soap opera to the extreme um, with all of these, you know, sort of reinvented versions of these characters. And there are little touchstones uh, that call back to the comic origins of the characters, which I love. I love the little Easter eggs and things. Um, but they have been insanely compelling with all of the twists and turns of the series, uh, this live action series. So um, the first of the anime that I'm watching on Wednesday is The Rising of the Shield Hero, which was really interesting to me. I didn't have necessarily any pointed interest in it, but I did sample out the first released episode, which ended up being like 45 minutes long. And in watching that, I was shocked that, you know, I was just coming up to the end of it and I was like, wow, that went really quick. I thought I had only been watching the show for like 15, 20 minutes. And then I realized, oh crap, it's almost an hour. <laughs> you know, it's just shy of an hour. That's how entertained I was by it. It thoroughly invested me, thoroughly drew me in. And that first 45 minute episode went by so quickly. So I was like, I'm definitely watching this. Um, and I've since watched uh, the second episode, which aired recently. I'm waiting for the third one sometime later today, as of the time of this recording. And uh, it's just been really cool. Uh, again, kind of an isekai series. Not even kind of. It is pointedly an isekai series. Um, but I love it. It's doing everything right for me right now as far as entertainment value goes. And then uh, also on Wednesdays is My Roommate is a Cat. And this is an adorable, sort of light and, and comedic kind of series, although it does have a couple heart-wrenching dramatic beats as well. Um, the unique thing about this series that I like is that each episode is kind of broken up into two halves. The first half is usually from the perspective of the human character, the main character, and then the second half of the episode is usually from the perspective of his cat, whom he had just recently adopted. A stray cat that, uh, you know, he just encountered one day and brought home. He is an aspiring writer, and, and I guess he's had a couple of jobs in the past that he's gotten published. And he was really seeking a new idea. And meeting this cat, this kitten, turns out to benefit him because it suddenly gives him a whole bunch of story ideas. He ends up writing this concept of, you know, like a, a, like a mystery where a cat is seeking revenge and, and going to murder somebody or something like that. Um, and it ends up proving big with, with fans and readers and such like that. So he's constantly taking inspiration from his interactions with the cat. But the cat also has a perspective on all of this. And we see in the first episode, very hearteningly, the cat sees that he is like a suffering artist. He doesn't take care of himself and he's starving all the time. And so the cat actually wants to feed him and take care of him in a similar fashion. At first, the cat wants to just get out of there, it wants to be fed and then leave. But then when this kitten realizes, oh, he's kind of, <laughs> you know, he can't really be self-reliant. He's not really taking care of himself the way he should be. I guess I have to stick around and take care of him. And it's just their playful relationship. The whole second episode was about how uh, he came around to naming the kitten and the name he picked for the kitten. The kitten associates with food. And so every time he says the name, I forget it off the top of my head, the cat comes running thinking, oh, I'm going to get fed now. <laughs> you know, it's adorable and it's funny and I love it. Um, that'll bring us on to Thursdays, and Thursday I'm watching two live-action series, The Orville and Star Trek Discovery, both of which I'm covering in episodic review discussions. And then uh, there's only one anime for Thursdays that I'm watching, which is The Quintessential Quintuplets. And I talked about this both on Facebook and my YouTube community feed, saying that I'm not usually into, you know, sexy anime girl kind of series or anything like that, or harems. I, I don't really get into that stuff. Um, at least not actively. Sometimes I'll end up watching a show that conforms to either one of those things. And uh, But this one happens to be both, and I'm actually enjoying it. It's basically about this cat who meets these quintuplets, these five sisters, whom he is tasked with tutoring, and none of them want to have anything to do with it. 
And then there's also a little tip of the hat that he ends up marrying one of them in the future. And so, you know, it's kind of a guessing game which one he's actually going to have an interest in uh, or which one's going to have an interest in him. And it's it's playful, it's funny, and I just I enjoy the look of the series, the animation and everything. And I already like three of the five girls, so <laughs> what can you do? Um, that'll bring us on to Fridays, and I'm watching uh, the carryover from the previous season, Hinamato Sumo, which is awesome sauce. I love it, and uh, can't get enough of it. And then uh, Boogie Pop and Others, which is an interesting series. I don't think I understood. I had to be, uh, this had to be explained to me on my anime list. Kind of akin to Rascal Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai, Boogie Pop is essentially supposed to be kind of an episodic thing where every couple of episodes focuses on whatever the latent character dilemma is, that kind of thing. Boogie Pop just happens to be this through line. And, and so each, you know, two or three episodes focuses on whatever the dilemma is, supernatural or otherwise, and uh, Boogie Pop is just there sort of observing it and sometimes gets involved. And um, it's, it's interesting. The pacing is relatively slow. It has been a little boring in places. Like, I've understood what's been going on from episode to episode, and I've understood each of the arcs, beginnings, middles, and ends. But I was sort of grasping at straws to figure out what the overarching plot was or what the overarching point was. And that's what I mentioned on my anime list and, you know, in the forums. And somebody said, well, it's actually supposed to be sort of vignettes uh, of different little short stories, you know, through two or three episodes. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I guess that makes sense in hindsight. And uh, I don't love it. I don't love the series. I know it's, uh, you know, there's, there's an original series from the early 2000s, I believe, that uh, has been recommended, you know, to me to watch if, if this doesn't make sense. And uh, it's not that it doesn't make sense, it's just it's, it's kind of a passive thing. I'm not really that invested in it. And then uh, rounding us off for Fridays is The Cost of Smiles, which has been a really enjoyable series thus far. Um, it, it kind of started out cute and funny because the main sort of focused upon character was this young girl princess who reminded me of uh, Nico Yazawa from Love Live in the way she's designed. Um, but she's very much naive and, and they've been keeping the cold hard truth of warring nations from her um she her nation that you know she oversees is at war with another nation and they've been hiding that from her and by the end of the second episode the cruel reality of that that other leg finally drops and she becomes aware when one of her best friends ends up biting the bullet and uh then the focus shifts because apparently the the characterization of the series is going to be split between she as a main character and then a psychotic you know, warrior chick on the opposite side, uh, who has like no emotions and takes lives with ease. She has no problem killing children. And so I'm just like, what the hell is the dynamic of this series going to be? The dichotomy there, the, the sheer ignorance and naivete and innocence on the one side, and then the sheer psychosis and murderous bloodlust or, or a lack of any compassion on the other side. And somehow, you know, you see in the OP, both these characters will come together and hold hands and smile at each other. So I'm like, huh? <laughs> you know, that's why I'm very much intrigued by it. Um, it's very compelling. And uh, that'll bring us on to Saturdays, where I'm only watching two series, and that is the continuing for quite a while now. I think we're up into the 40s, uh, as far as episodes go. Gegege no Kitaro, and uh, I just mentioned that in a recent post on my both my Facebook account and my YouTube community feed, how... Uh, deep the series sometimes goes in, in the frailty and the hubris of humanity and the latest episode was no exception it was absolutely compelling and uh you know i, I suggest you go back and read my write-up of it if you haven't seen it um but it is it continues to be an entertaining series and really awesome and then finally rounding us out for the entirety of the winter 2019 season is sword art online alicization which carries over as well from the previous season now, I love this series. I've been loving it since episode one, um, even though, you know, the pacing, it only goes so far episode to episode, but I'm really intrigued by the story. And I've had, a, a, you know, as I've talked about Sword Art Online all throughout my history of uh, covering anime on YouTube, I have said that it has been a, a love-hate relationship kind of dynamic I've had with the series. I really loved the first half of the very first season, the second half of which was kind of faulty. It was really kind of imperfect and I didn't really jive with it as much. With the second season of SAO, it's probably my favorite 
iteration of the series thus far, the GGO or Gun Gale Online arc, which was the first half of season two. The second half of season two was also enjoyable. It was really emotional and things like that. Um, but the end all be all for me has, has thus far always been SAO2. And then uh, the follow up movies and, and things of that nature. And so Alicization picks up from where it all left off. And it's really intriguing because you're dealing with Carito, the main character, having been attacked in the early going of, of the Alicization series with a drug that threatened to put him in a coma and, and cause brain damage. And so he has been jacked in against his awareness or his will, really, to an, you know, sort of a MMORPG, VRPG sort of framework. And he's living and thriving within it in the hope that he won't succumb to, uh, you know, brain damage or, or fall into a coma, that it'll keep him alive, essentially. And uh, the only minor complaint I have is we haven't seen enough of like Asuna and the real world. She ended up, you know, investigating where he went because when he went into a coma, he was rushed to the hospital, his body then disappeared. And she did some investigating to figure out where he was moved to, got some assistance from other people who are aware of what's going on with this, uh, you know, MMO VRPG kind of thing um, that, that he has been jacked into. And so she found out where he was and she is now there. Um, but she hasn't had any interaction with him, and the focus has thus far mainly been on what he's going through inside this MMO VRPG framework. Um, I, I do want to see a little more of what's going on outside of that, and whether or not they can jack in and communicate with him. They've already kind of given a tip to the hat with one of the characters creating like a, you know, like a robot kind of thing, where they can maybe implant these souls, for lack of a better term, of these fictional characters within the environment, they could potentially pluck one out and put it into the robot and suddenly the robot can move around and walk around and uh, interact with the actual legitimate real world. And I'm already suspecting that may be something they use for uh, the, the secondary main character, Yujio, in, in the series, uh, who's partnered with Kurito. And they're both going on this journey together because within it, they had a friend who had uh, inadvertently broken one of the sacred rules of, of the environment and was taken away and she's been reforged, reformatted. Her brain has been completely cleared of any, you know, human memories to become a warrior for the sort of, uh, you know, overarching hierarchy, which is led by this female character called the administrator who actually has been able to become aware of this virtual environment, kind of all of the matrix and Neo, uh, you know, figuring out that they're in sort of a, a computerization thing, a digital virtual world. And uh, so she's been able to sort of bend and break the rules to her will. And she's created sort of an army of warriors, one of which happens to be the friend that both Kirito and Yujiyo knew. And so they're trying to ascend this grand tower to find her and, and get her back and give her back her memories and save her life and all this kind of stuff. And uh, so it's really intriguing, you know, everything that's going on within the virtual world. But as I say, um, the one minor gripe that I have is that we haven't seen enough of what's going on in the real world. And uh, But it also still kind of makes sense because for all the time that is passing in the virtual world, you know, it, it's days and months and, and that's only minutes for we on the outside, you know, for the real people. Um, so it's intriguing and I'm loving it. It is probably one of the best iterations of Sword Art Online thus far, has not had any qualms or complaints that I could perceive uh, in my watching of it, except for, as I say, wanting to see more Asuna in the real world. And so that'll pretty much do it for the winter 2019 anime season. That's everything I'm locked into watching. Um, there have been a couple of other shows that I sampled out the first few minutes of the first episodes and just didn't jive with me for whatever reason. And I, I didn't have any interest in, so I didn't even mark it on my anime list as dropped uh, because I don't. If I don't finish an episode, I don't count it as being watched. And uh, this is pretty much everything that has had my interest or has my interest and uh, has been entertaining. And, you know, th that's pretty much what I'm going to stick to. Um, but I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments below what uh, stuff you're watching for the winter 2019 season. Uh, anything you're really loving, anything you already dropped, love it or hate it, anything goes in the comments below. And I'd also like to ask at this juncture if you would like to consider supporting my channel, please have a look at my PayPal contribution link posted both in the description as well as the comments below, which affords you opportunities very much akin to Patreon in that 
You can set up a monthly contribution, a one-time only contribution, or you can send me a personal message alongside a contribution requesting topics I may discuss in the future, ask for shout outs, make recommendations of things I could check out, and uh, all that good stuff. And anything you saw fit to send my way would just be far and away awesome sauce, two thumbs up for me, and would secure my longevity on YouTube. And uh, it would be a direct line of support to me. So um, yeah, that would be very much appreciated. And otherwise, that'll be pretty much it for me on this. Hope this video finds you well. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.